Brenna here, Dryfly Pro. Uh, today we're going to interview um, Rick Hayfley, who is an amazing person, a uh, fly fisherman, a biologist uh, focused on aquatic insects. And he's also the author of a number of important books. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna get to know Rick a little bit, and I'm excited about the interview. So um, let's get started without hesitation. Rick, the first and uh, first question for me is, how did you find yourself uh, in the West Coast? Well, it was a lot different than Illinois. Um, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I'd never been out west, you know. When I left Illinois, I grew up in a small farm town, and I was I was pretty uh, uh, naive and uh, just didn't under didn't know what I was getting into but obviously it was wonderful and uh you know I picked up with some friends and started fishing some of the small creeks uh in the area but then also salmon and steelhead fishing were the big items to fish for in that part of Washington the Skagit and the the uh the Nooksack and all those really great rivers and that was at a time when the steelhead fishing was was quite exceptional still. Um, that was uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so I did fish for those, but my heart was really uh, in trout fish, fishing for trout. And uh, that's where I really kind of focused and just enjoyed exploring that whole region around the North Cascades. Um, Did you find dry fly waters and trout waters um, in those areas? I did. There was a little lake. I'm trying to think. It was near Lake Padden, which is up on outside outskirts of Bellingham now. And it was a little creek coming into us. It wasn't Lake Padden itself, but it was near there. And um, I would go there in the mornings and early you know, afternoon and uh, when I had a chance. And there would be insects hatching in the creek, floating down into the lake, and had just some great dry fly fishing in the lake uh, with the mayfly hatches that were drifting in from the stream. And um, yeah, I had some good dry fly fishing. Um, and, you know, caught some steelhead on dry flies too, skating, skating flies. Um, yeah. yeah, so there, there, was, uh, there was a lot of, uh, opportunities around there to just explore it wasn't um, like anywhere you know it wasn't as crowded then there weren't as many people in Bellingham in well, I came out to uh, Washington in 1974 um, and uh, was uh, was initially a little disappointed because I couldn't figure out uh, the kinds of trout streams that I had grown used to in what's called the driftless area, Wisconsin, uh, southern Minnesota, and, and uh, eastern Iowa. Um, but I, uh, but I then learned that on the other side of the Cascades, uh, there was great fishing, and so my home waters I mostly consider to be on the east side of the river, uh, 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 east side of the mountains. Yeah, that's a good point because the <clears throat> the trout fishing in western Washington is not anything that we'd, you know, people would consider that great, uh, right. though there's some decent trout fishing be had. Oregon, I think, um, is a little different. Yeah. Um, and the Willamette Valley uh, is a little different. Um, and so there is more uh, in the way of actual focused attention on trout fishing down here than you might find in, in that part of Washington. Yeah. So as um, as your uh, career progressed, you uh, ended up with a uh, was it a doctorate or a master's degree? Master's degree in a, yep aquatic entomology. Yep. And you uh, and and then you found work in uh, Oregon, yeah. and um, and so you pretty much settled there and started uh, uh, getting actively involved in in a dual career. When did you first pick up the idea that you wanted to write about what you were doing? Yeah, um, you know, it, it was one of those things that, um, you know, say they are, there are no coincidences in life, but um, when I was, when I was in grad school, um, there, they had a program at Oregon State then called the Free U, and it was um, just a, a group of folks there that if you had an idea to teach a class, 
they would find you a room. They had a process to, they had a little you know, newsletter that would advertise what people were offering. And it was all free. You didn't get paid to teach it. Uh, nobody had to pay to take a class. And it was open to the public. It wasn't just you know, students that could uh, participate. And it was pretty popular at the time. And so on a wild hair, I think it was probably after I was into graduate school for a while, I thought, well, I'm going to offer a class on aquatic entomology for fly fishermen. Yeah. And I called it Entomology and the Artificial Fly. And lo and behold, some people signed up for it. And so one of those people, and one of the people I met as a grad student, I was a teaching assistant, so I was teaching a number of the classes, including aquatic entomology. And uh, the, my major professor, uh, I signed up to take aquatic entomology and he said, oh no, you can't take it. You're gonna have to teach the lab. <laughs> I said, well, I've never taken aquatic entomology. And he says, well, that's okay, you'll learn it. And so <laughs> I, I learned by the seat of my pants teaching the aquatic ent lab. I was you know, one day ahead of the people in the lab that first year. Uh, but one of the people in my second year uh, there doing the aquatic ent lab was Dave Hughes. He signed up to take aquatic wow. entomology and wow. he was just auditing the class because he wanted to learn more about bugs because he was into fly fishing. And so I met Dave uh, my second year there. That was 1975 is when I met Dave. And, and, and he wrote his first uh, book in and around that time, right? Well, the, the first book was... Patches? That was the book we did together. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that was the book we did together. Um, yeah, Western Hatches. And, uh, and so, uh, but I taught this class on uh, through the Free U and people signed up. And so then Dave and I had met and we said, well, let's let's do this together. I'll do the entomology part. You do the, the fly pattern part and we'll do it as a team. Cool. And, and that took off. And we said, well, heck, um, you know, there's enough interest in this. Uh, we wrote up quite a, a comprehensive uh, pamphlet that went along with the class. And that, again, the pamphlet was called Entomology and the Artificial Fly. And uh, Frank Amato uh, saw that pamphlet and said, oh, you guys should do a book on this. And that became the complete book of Western Hatches. Okay, okay. And that was, that was the first book that Dave did. And of course, the first one I did. So um, uh, one of the things that I love about uh, the books that both you and Dave um, uh, co-authored is that um, while it is loaded with scientific information, um, having been deeply involved in fly fishing, but having a career that had nothing to do with fly fishing, um, I was very interested in entomology and aquatic insects. But when I would read up about it, it, I couldn't connect the two to fly fishing experiences. And that's what I loved about you, your guys' work is that, that, that um, you, didn't, you, didn't te you didn't talk science at us. You, you talked fishing at us and you said, hey, here's how um, aquatic insect understanding can improve your fly fishing. And it certainly did. Yeah, well, thank you. That, that was uh, one of our goals or... And one of the reasons I enjoy it so much is that it's really a great tool to introduce um, the public, broader public, to a lot of um, cool information about what's out there, you know, and the, the, without getting bogged down in the, you know, science of it all. Um, and so I think that's one of the more enjoyable parts about writing about it. And um, it's it's been it's been a lot of fun to do over the years. Um, and I think, you know, we we're having a brief conversation earlier. I spent my days working full time out on rivers and streams doing uh, water quality uh, studies. And then I spent my free time out on rivers and streams fishing. So I spent a lot of time in, <laughs> in, in that environment, which I consider a very uh, fortunate <laughs> kind of turn of events. So really your passions came together. Very much so. Yeah, that's awesome. one that's of the awesome. people that, uh, and when I went to grad school, I was, again, pretty naive about the whole thing. I never even asked my major professor, can you get a job as an aquatic entomologist? What do you do? <laughs> you know, I didn't even ask the question or even research it. I had no clue. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I was just about 
a month away from finishing my final dissertation and my final exams, um, my wife was eight months pregnant. And I said, man, I'm going to have to get a job. And uh, just about the same time, a fellow from that worked for a consulting company in Portland called my major professor and said, hey, we need an aquatic entomologist on this job. Do you know anybody? Wow. And, yeah. And so he said, yeah. And so <laughs> I went up and interviewed and got the job. And I never even had to send a resume out anywhere. I got into job right off the bat. And it was a great job. I did work up in Alaska and Colorado and Excellent. Flying in in helicopters, doing some remote stream sampling, and it, it was it was a great job. Um, so, uh, I guess again the stars aligned, and I I uh, got work right off the bat. So so um, the 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 work on authorship and entomology was was intermixed really with your fly fishing, and and that became a, a significant uh, part of what you were trying to do. Uh, fascinating, just fascinating, because you know I spent a lot of time as after I got out west trying to understand all kinds of things about uh, the fish and the waters and the, and obviously the insects and the and the proper flies. Um, so I would call the Washington State uh, uh, Fish and Game Department and asked to speak with uh, um, different biologists. And they were very, uh, very um, uh, great with the time that they would spend with me. And I picked up bits and pieces, but I had so much trouble understanding all of the different categories of insects. I kind of sure. got it down to genus, but that's about as best okay. as I could do. Um, but boy, did I learn a lot about flies and fly tying. So are you a fly tire too? I believe I know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I don't know. We can, there's, I'm sitting at my fly tying desk right now, basically. Yeah, um, and I started. As, as am I. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> Two peas in a pod. Um, <laughs> you know, I started tying flies when I was 12 as well. And, and there was nobody around where I grew up in the little farm town that tied flies or you, it was hard to even find a place to buy a fly rod where I grew up. Um, and so I, I don't even remember how I heard about it, but Herder's catalog was the only place to get fly tying equipment at the time. That's, that's so right. I the, yeah. So I ordered a beginning tight fly tying kit from Herder's and just went through it and said, well, this must be how you do it. It kind of looked like the pictures. <laughs> and um, and that was fishing for bluegill and bass back in Illinois. So the fish weren't very sophisticated and they would still actually take a fly that looked uh, like mine looked, were, weren't very good. Uh, and when I, when I moved out west to Bellingham and stuff, I met other fly fishermen and I got involved with fly fishing clubs. And, and really there were a number of people that became extremely, you know, teachers to me in learning tying and, and a lot more about fly fishing. Uh, yeah, and and understanding insects and tying flies is not necessarily the same experience. It's uh, um, I'm pretty pleased when I get a pattern that vaguely represents the the fly that I know is on the water. Well, when you get into fly tying, you get into all sorts of debates about why they work, what's going to work, what's not going to work, what color to use. I mean, that's what we've written a lot about over the years is, is what uh, characteristics of a fly pattern are important and which ones aren't so important, you know, in terms of, in terms of trout fishing. Now we really have to, you know, realize that all of my time in writing and stuff has really been focused on trout and not- Yeah, and, and th that's my love too. So it, it works for me just fine. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a a bit of a mystery question that that's always confused me, and I and I um, uh, I I don't want to suggest that this is a common occurrence because I've only had it happen to me a few times, but um, occasionally I'll find myself on a good uh, stretch of water. There is active feeding trout, and there are two hatches. And they are distinct enough, so it's obvious which ones they're, you know, blue winged olives and pale evening uh, duns, you know. Um, and the fish will will trigger on one, but they will ignore the other. Now, how does that happen? Well, that's happened to me many times. Um, uh -huh. 
And uh, it's, I think it's a very common phenomena in a stream that's productive, where you get two good hatches or even more coming off. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always um, related to it in this way that, um, you know, we know fish are going to have to manage their energy to their advantage. They can't spend more energy working to get food than they get out of the food they're eating. So they have to um, that just naturally do that. And I think one way that that does work is to get um, a um, search image on whatever they're feeding on. And that search image, you know, if it's the small blue winged olive is uh, what they just have this, you know, focus, you know, like if you dropped a thousand pennies and in one, you know, there's uh, 10 dimes and you're looking for the pennies, um, you're gonna be able to go along and pick up the pennies and not worry about the dimes at all. And so at any rate, I think they get this really focused search image and the rest of those other insects are almost not even, you know, they're not paying attention to them. And it, it's a way of saving energy. I think it saves them energy in terms of the feeding activity. And that, you know, it, that's partly the conclusion that I had, but I'm not a scientist and so I didn't know. Is there, is there a taste feature to insects for aquatic fish, uh, for trout? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't doubt it though. Um, <laughs> I mean, look at ants, right? If ants are on the water, trout are going to go for them. I mean, they absolutely go crazy for ants. Yeah. So you would think, well, there's got to be something there just besides something good. <laughs> and and blueing olives, I have found blueing olives, in my experience, will always be the preferred mayfly if there's more items than that on the water. That you, that you, has been my experience as well. Um, and I've been in I many hatches. Yeah, I've been in many hatches where there's a great hatch of green drakes coming off. Yeah, mixed in is a little blueing olive, and you're thinking, oh my god, I'm going to have to put on that 18 instead of this size 10 because the fish are ignoring the green drakes. What's with that? And, and so um, is it taste? Um, it could be, I don't know. Well, I, I know they're capable of taste. I mean, that's, that's kind of understood, but I wasn't sure whether bugs had a particular flavor or not. Well, I've eaten a lot of them and they do. I mean, I've tried different <laughs> aquatic insects because I've been curious and I've eaten quite a few of them and, and they do taste different. Um, and yeah, so like, yeah, and uh, salmon flies do not taste good. I would not eat another salmon fly. <laughs> but golden stones, golden stones taste quite nice. They they kind of taste like little fresh cut grass stems and stuff. Uh, how about October caddis? I know that the nymph stage is actually a food dish in in some uh, communities. I haven't eaten those, so I've eaten a, quite a few different caddis flies, but I haven't eaten October caddis. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> there's still some there's still some research to do <laughs> um so talk to me a little bit about um the kinds of waters uh because i think there's another element to becoming a, a great fly fisherman is obviously uh reading waters and making great presentations and that's lefty cray you know um loud and clear um uh it do you did you uh, pay attention to um, water flow and reading currents and all of those kinds of things to enhance your sport, or were you um, uh, so focused on entomology and the insects available that you you know chose your patterns based on that? Well, I chose my patterns, I think, largely on the entomology side of it, but in terms of fishing the patterns. Um, definitely uh, the kind of water you're in, where you're present, presenting the flies, you know, reading the water um, was a big, is, is a big, big part of one's success. Uh, and presentation, I think, is always one of those challenges for a new fly fisherman. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's a confusing sport when you're starting out and you go into a fly shop and it's completely overwhelming, I think, to beginners. Um, well, as you know, uh, the brand that I that I have is Dry Fly Pro, and 
Uh, about 25 years ago, I gave up fishing anything except dry flies for a simple reason. It was the, for me, it was the most exciting moment there is in fly fishing when a fish comes up, especially if they come up calmly and carefully and suck in your fly, you have fooled them completely. It's a testament to the fly that you tied. It's a testament to, to the presentation you made. And you're, it was a testament to the way you read the water. And so that became the thrill. And I, I didn't care about any other kind of fishing after that. So um, uh, I've, really, I've really enjoyed doing that. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think most fly fishers do like that. <laughs> we kind of, I, you know, uh, in some ways, a lot of people would structure their fishing season around the hatches you know, where they're going to go, when they're going to go there, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to go to Montana for, you know, whatever, the green drake hatch or the trico hatch, you know, the, and so you kind of time your fishing around those events because you get this chance for that kind of dry fly action. I mean, it's, yeah. it's super yeah. exciting. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you show up and the weather's off and nothing's happening in, on the surface and you're going to scratch your head. Well, what do I do now? And so, you know, I wrote the book on nymph fishing, rivers and streams. So I've, I've spent a lot of time nymph fishing. And I, yeah. I find nymph fishing, um, what I like about it is the mystery because you don't see the fish. You don't, you can't predict where they're at. Well, you can predict where they're at, but you don't see where they're at. Right. So it really, really comes down to reading the water. And you know, when, when I first started there, there was, there was no such thing as a bead headed nymph. And, and so, you know, pheasant tails and hare's ears, and we've fished them almost more like a dead drift wet fly, just subsurface. And you did see fish come and take them. Um, but when, when it became popular to get down on the bottom, um, I didn't find it very interesting because I couldn't see it happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just kind of find it uh, an interesting mystery of, of predicting where you think the fish will be and then presenting the nymph in that spot correctly. And if you get a take, I usually use an indicator. So if you get a take, you see the indicator perhaps move a little bit um, and you go, oh, I was right. You know, I solved that mystery. There was a fish there and I caught it. Um, Charlie Brooks, you know, wrote Nymph Fishing for Larger Trout, one of the mm -hmm. books I spent a lot of time reading at the time it came out. Um, <clears throat> and I interviewed Charlie Brooks way back in the day. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I did a, my own little newsletter a um, long time ago. And part of it, I would call up people and interview them for an article in the newsletter. And Charlie was a great character. And... Um, he did a lot of scuba diving, you know, just uh, not scuba, but snorkeling in streams, watching fish. Uh, and, and his uh, theory was that trout were just as selective to nymphs as they would be to a dry fly. So <clears throat> if you don't have the particular nymph on that's abundant and available, your nymph fishing success won't be that great. But if you can figure it out, uh, than it is, which tied into my interest in entomology great, because I was always picking up rocks and kicking around in streams, seeing what nymphs were there and mm -hmm. larvae. And uh, I would be, you know, selecting my nymph patterns based on what I saw in the stream bottom. And so it all made sense to me. So what are your favorite hatches? Do, do you have such a thing or uh, mm -hmm. whatever's on the water is what uh, matters to you? Yeah, whatever's on the water is what matters to me in that regard. Um, I mean, there there are some uh, over the years. Uh, I've I've fished a, a long time now, and um, there are streams that I go back to because I enjoy the environment and I expect there's a certain hatch going to happen. And um, in the fall, there's a hatch on a couple of streams in. Uh, the southern end of British Columbia. And um, it's, it's a small mayfly. I don't even know what the common name would be. Um, it's, it's Sinigmula is the genus, and it has this little yellow wing, and it's about a size 16. And it's just a really interesting mayfly hatch. And so what I kind of gravitate to now are kind of the unusual hatches, you know? Okay. 
uh, just because it's fascinating to see something different. Sure. And the Sinag Mula hatch is one of those that I find just a fascinating mayfly. It's really pretty and you don't find it in a lot of places. Uh, it hatches on the Metolius River in Oregon at a completely different time of year there. But And that's uh, a tough stream to fish. That's, it, I, I found it really difficult. <laughs> it's too clear. <laughs> it's too clear. And, and there's not a lot of days where the fish are up feeding. Right. On the surface. There are those times when they are. And the green drake hatch is the best time to fish the Metolius. The last week of May, first week of June is okay. the green drake okay. hatch. And, and well, I fish quite a bit in, in Oregon. And so I've uh, played around with some of the smaller streams. Um, uh, yeah, but I'd like to switch uh, subjects, uh, trigger on something that you said. So you mentioned brooks. Are there other um, uh, fly fishermen, you didn't necessarily have to have a personal um, knowledge of them, but uh, that you really respect and admire? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, Ernie Schwiebert, um, you know, back when I was uh, cutting my teeth in fly fishing is when he came out with, with uh, Match the Hatch. And, and then later Nymphs, uh, which is I think one of the more, uh, well, one of the more impactful books that I've read at the time was just his book called Nymphs. And uh, not because he was kind of crazy with nymph patterns. I mean, he had a, a unique pattern for every nymph in the world. Huh. And it's kind of nuts because you would never need to tie that many different specific patterns, in my opinion. But his writing ability was awesome. He could really just write a great short story uh, about a fishing experience somewhere in either Patagonia or Colorado or wherever. And he just, uh, he was a great writer and just a brilliant person when it comes to his knowledge. You know, he's probably a genius. <laughs> and so, you know, he was an amazing uh, set of facts he could just kind of bring up in his head at any time. Uh, you know, it's, and, it's interesting to me. Go ahead. Haig Brown, Roderick Haig Brown, if you out West, oh. you know, his writing yeah. and books were- Incredible work. Pretty inspiring person. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever been to Vancouver Island? Oh yes, I've I've been okay. to Canada River and and stuff. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible fellow. Yeah. Um, uh, so one of the things. Uh, so I'm a fly casting instructor as well. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, uh, has always startled me about um, the new generation of fly fishers is. Um, they're not aware of the incredible history of the sport and the prolific numbers of authors, and they write about certain parts and pieces that are variable. Did you ever uh, encounter Colonel Harding and his work on uh, trout vision? Yes. Amazing. Yes. Am and amazing stuff. And in talking about authors that influenced me, um, uh, Skews was the one uh, older English author that uh, I've read just about everything he's written, uh, George Edward Mackenzie Skews. My son's middle name is Mackenzie because I named that after Skews' <laughs> middle name. And um, I, I th he had this interesting analytical mind, but he was... Um, he was very promoted very much that people had to go out and learn it yourself. Don't listen to the people telling you how it is. Right. Go out and see how it is. Right. And well, and of course, the debate between Halford and Skews is, is you know, alive today. I, yeah. saw, um, I saw a video recently, a group of gentlemen in Britain held a, uh, a Zoom call with like 40 or 50 fly fishermen, and they argued about Halford and Skews the whole time. I, I thought it was great. I, oh, I've always felt like Skews contributed more to dry fly fishing than he did to nymph fishing because he helped us understand what the heck these little critters were that were coming up off the bottom. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the lines in, in, um, I can't remember if it was itching memories or not, but anyway, it was that experts are the opiate of the masses. And uh, I always thought that was a great line. And so, you know, as a writer and you're writing all this, throwing it out there, you know, well, don't believe me just outright, go test it 
and see if it's really true for you. And, yeah. and I think that's part of the excitement. You know, starting fly fishing when you're young, you don't know anything and you don't care that you don't know anything. Right. right. And you just go do it. Right. And you make tons of mistakes, but it's in that process that I think you find the joy of the whole thing is yes. that, you know, so I, I feel bad in a way uh, for some of the beginners now because everything is so available to get told to you. You go thousands of videos. Here's how you do it. What's left up to the individual to go out and just flail around and experiment, you know? Uh, you know, I have the same concern for this new generation of fly fishers. Um, the, the people that I get, they're very interested, obviously, in casting because that's what I'm teaching them. But um, then they, you know, I always give lots of time after a lesson so that they can ask questions. And, and they almost invariably um, move to questions about anything from aquatic insects to dry or nymph uh, to uh, rivers and, and locations. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sorely tempted not to be critical of them, but just say, well, why don't you just Google it? Um, because I, I tell the story when I learned how to fly fish, I did two things when I went on a, a and it was just a day trip. It was somewhere within a few hundred miles of Minneapolis was where I lived. I would hit every small town and check out their library to mm. find out if I could find another book on fly fishing. The literature was overwhelming. And I remember the first fly fishing specific um, magazine that was published in the late 1980s. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is breakthrough stuff. So it is interesting that, that um, yeah. I, I almost feel like uh, the en most enjoyable par part of fly fishing is for us older folks, because we get to explore stuff that we've thought about our whole lives and and uh, and didn't necessarily have the time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, here's a question for you, David. Um, what's the first thing you do when you walk down to the water to start fishing for the day? And, and I, I open my eyes. <laughs> um, I I look. I somewhere along the line, someone said the word "observe" to me and. We might have even been talking about hunting for all I know, but it's stuck in my mind. And then on a couple of occasions, I would encounter fly fishermen and sit and watch them. And I'd learn something about fly casting and I would learn something about, you know, presentation and whatever. But yeah, the first thing I do is just look, um, what's going on here? And uh I think that's one of the really fun things to do is just pay attention and you might surprise yourself and it leads to a great day of fishing because you realize that the fish are interested in a particular thing and, and bingo, you're on it. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's, that would be my answer too, is I, I often uh, try to uh, instill that in folks when I'm in teaching workshops, because as you're walking down, you can be looking up, are there swallows in the air? You know, mm -hmm. there's swallows, there's something up there they're eating. What is it? That's right. You know, shake the trees as you get to the bank and caddis fly out or something else. You know, is the wind blowing? If it's blowing, it might be blowing something into the water. What's on the bank that's getting blown in? Uh, and then, of course, you know, when you get to the you know, and see the water, is there anything hatching? One of the places that people tend not to uh, think about observing uh, that I try to stress is that you find the little patches of foam along the bank where yep. there's a little eddy and you know just some crud is accumulated. If you look really closely in it, not always, but often, there'll be the empty shucks of what's been hatching. Exactly. And it could be a mayfly, it might be a, a little midge, a caddis pupa. And those clues like that can be tremendously helpful. Um, you, you you mentioned uh, Griffith's gnat uh, somewhere in, in my reading about you, and uh, that's another insect that is is uh, not well understood. I I don't believe um, uh, you know midges are really prolific and a major item on trout diets, um, and some of the most fun I've ever had has been standing in the slick of a big pool 
with hundreds of fish around me si sipping midges. Um, sure. It's a blast. Absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. And from the entomology side of things, uh, midges, the family Chironomidae, is the most diverse group of aquatic insects out there. I mean, they're literally, you could go out, I'm sure, tomorrow and dig around and find a species that's never been classified before. <laughs> uh, there are just hundreds of species of chironomids out there. And they're in every part of the stream. They're in the pools, they're in the riffles, um, they're in the fastest cascades. So they're everywhere on the stream bottom. And any trout stomach study that I've done personally and ones that I've read, which I've read quite a few over on my uh, professional career, chronomids always come up, if not the top food item in their guts, one of the top five. Wow. And so chronomids, and of course, most of the time that's in pupa stage or larval stage, sure. not the adult yeah. stage, but um, they're an incredibly important part of the food chain and the ecology of the stream. They certainly are. They certainly are. Yeah. Uh, um, and and they frustrate most fishermen. Um, uh, that's why I was impressed with the fact that you uh, mentioned Griffith's gnat, because um, it's not an exact copy. It certainly doesn't imitate the pupa stage in any way. Um, but the, the trout will, will come to that almost irregardless of what kind of um, uh, midge is actually hatching. Yeah, yeah, get the size close, it helps. Uh, but yeah. uh, that's, that's definitely true. It's a good pattern for chronomids and for midges. Um, and then in lake fishing, you know, it's really, I had an interesting experience this spring fishing lakes. Um, it was in Eastern Oregon. We had some fantastic fishing. It was, uh, we had a very late spring this year. And so went there hoping to find the Calabetus mayflies hatching, but it was still cold and they weren't coming off. But from about 10 o'clock till three o'clock every day, the chronomids were coming up. It was a good midge hatch. And the people I was with uh, consistently were fishing pupa, often hanging below a dry fly as an you know, indicator, just to suspend the pupa, maybe two feet below the surface. And, and they were catching a lot of fish. Wow. Um, but the fish were rising and they were taking the pupa, I mean, the, um, the midges right on the surface in the film as they were emerging. And I thought, man, heck, I am not gonna fish a pupa pattern. I'm gonna fish a, you know, uh, a little film, something in the film. Uh, sure. It was basically dry fly fishing, though I wasn't using a classic dry fly. I was fishing an emerger in the film. And I caught the heck out of the fish, but I was casting the rising trout and uh, it was a blast. And I thought, <laughs> well, why would I dangle a pupa under the surface if I can cast to these rising fish? And uh, I hear you. Watch them take the fly. And these uh, were some I fish. I mean, these are some 20 inch plus rainbows. And, wow. and wow. They, would, they would take that fly and just start sprinting for the other side of the lake. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it, was, fun. it was a blast. It was an absolute <laughs> blast. Uh -huh. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that the, the other fellows were really, um, and they were catching lots of fish, so you can't blame them for doing it. Sure. But uh, yeah, they, they were really dialed into fishing that pupa. Uh, um, do, you, do you know much about Rene Harrop? Uh, yeah, I do. I use one of several of his fly patterns are my favorites. His, uh, his, some of his patterns are amazing. I, uh, I have a couple of um, uh, variations of last chance in different small sizes and colors. Um, I think it's the best blue winged olive pattern that there is, plain and simple. Yeah. And I reach for it whenever I see even a marginal hatch because blue winged olives are hatching all the time. Um, so uh, I, I've always been impressed with his work. I just wondered if you. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I use his Harrop Dunn. And I don't know if the okay. last one is similar to the Harrop Dunn, but his Harrop Dunn dry fly, mayfly pattern, I tie in all different sizes and, and colors. And it's been my go-to dry fly for mayflies for a long time. Wow, wow. Well, um, uh, the last chance is an interesting one because it's supposedly a cripple. And okay. what I've turned it into is an emerger pattern. So it's basically, um, I, I do it on a, a, a small um, Diachi 1160, which is a, 
um, which is, a, uh, I'm sure you know, a, a, a deep curve. It's, a, it's designed for, for para flies, really. Um, and, uh, and so mine uh, is emerging, not crippled. And um, it's just, it just gets nailed, so. Yeah, that's great, because I fish emergers a lot with blue winged olives. And I just use a little, you know, you're tying it on a small hook, size 18 often, and I just use a little CDC over the, as the wing case, and it floats it in the film. And, and last it, chance is CDC, um, yeah. it, you know, in a, in a biot, and it's just wonderful. Yeah. So. Those are those are so much fun to fish and they work extremely well. That's yeah. cool. That's, yes. Now here's some since you're a dry fly purist, I mean, I fish soft tackles a lot. And and I I would not want to give up fishing soft tackles, uh, you know, as a choice of ways to fish, because they're very effective and they're a lot of fun to catch. I you know, I think the distinction for fly uh, for dry flies is getting a little bit um uh, moved about because I I view an emerging pattern, um, a cripple, um, a, a pure dry fly, whether it's a para or a cat skill pattern. Yeah. In my mind, they all do what you described. Uh, they bring trout all the way to the top. And that's what I want more than anything else. I want to see that fish take yeah. my fly. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, swinging soft tackles, like if it's a slow day, there's no hatch. I don't want to fish nymphs. I'll put on a soft tackle and just swing it through riffles. And it's not on the surface, you know, it's there sure. in the key below. And it's not on a dead drift. Uh, it's on the swing. There are times when, man, that's really effective. And, you know, uh, that's one of the techniques that I've pretty much given up over the last 25 years. And I really should go back to that because I loved swinging uh, wet flies. I, I, I mean, it, yeah. it's it's kind of lazy, but you don't have to worry about reading water perfectly. You just, you just have to fish a bunch of it. It's it's a way of covering a lot of water when you aren't sure where the fish are going to be, what they're going to be taking. You can cover a lot of water quickly, and so it puts the fly out there in front of more fish, you know, efficiently. Yeah. And I think uh, because of that, you know, you can have some good success. But there are times when it's just deadly. I mean, uh, it's, I've had some times like, oh. well, one time in Tunnel the Crow's Nest, which is up in Southern Alberta. Okay. Great, great trout stream in Southern Alberta. Um, fishing along, it was overcast, a little drizzly. You thought it would just be great dry fly fishing. There's some mayflies hatching, could not could not catch a fish on a dry fly. And it was just driving us nuts. And started swinging some soft tackles in the riffles and you couldn't keep them off. <laughs> it, it, was, it was just like, you know. It's another one of those beautiful things about the sport is that you never know what's gonna make your day. Something yeah. might, and it may not even involve catching fish. That's so. right, that's right, that's exactly <laughs> um, right. You mentioned Alaska. I have a son who lives in Alaska and has been there for uh, over a decade now. Um, he's a musician and that's his primary uh, passion and love, but he's an excellent fly fisherman. I taught him, so of course he would be. Um, uh, have you fished much in Alaska? Uh, no, not much. I've fished in Alaska on a number of different occasions, but I, um, when I was working up there, um, it was, and I would Fortunately, I had a chance to take fly rods with me when I'd go up. It was kind of, it, <laughs> I, I, it was, it was kind of crazy because we were. I was working in the Misty Fjords National Monument, which is in inland in, in the mountains from Ketchikan, yeah. and we'd fly in in helicopters to these remote camps, and we'd be flying out the rivers to do water quality studies and fish surveys and so forth. Well, there were a number of occasions where the mining camp, it was a mining camp, it wasn't an active mine, but it was where a bunch of uh, geologists were hanging out doing surveys for the ore and so, so forth. And there might've been 30 or 40 people in this camp. And the cook would say, hey, I need some salmon, go catch me a couple. And the helicopter would drive, fly me down to a sandbar, gravel bar, drop me off and come back in an hour and a half and expect me to have a half a dozen salmon. Well. <laughs> There were so many fish. 
<laughs> oh, it was easy, unfortunately. Oh, it was? <laughs> there were so many salmon in the river, you'd feel your fly line going over their backs. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the challenge was you didn't want to snag one because you could never land the darn thing. And yeah. these were chum salmon. We we're only about, oh, a mile from the ocean. So they were bright chum salmon, Beautiful. which was strong fish, <laughs> incredibly strong fish. So I'd go fish for an hour and a half. They'd come pick me up in the helicopter and I'd have, you know, four or five big chum salmon and take them back to camp and the cook would cook them up. <laughs> now, do you, do you know about Alaska's regulations around uh, dip netting uh, um, sockeyes in certain rivers? I don't know the regulations on that. Um, uh, if you're a resident of Alaska, your household, not you as the individual, but everybody in your family um, is permitted to take 35 fresh sockeyes directly out of the river during the run with big long handled dip nets. Oh, and cool. my son does that every year. He doesn't kill a fish. All of his fishing, all, all year, he doesn't kill a fish because he's got a freezer full <laughs> of sockeye. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, it's, it's something to see because as a fish biologist, um, it was wonderful to work up there in that environment. It was truly pristine. The watersheds were untouched uh, by any human activity. There had been no logging in these watersheds. And, and in Southeast Alaska, it's a lot like um, what Oregon and Washington coastal streams sure. would have been like, uh -huh. you know, 200 years ago. And yeah. so, it, you know, wood, log jams every quarter mile, there was a big log jam. And these are good sized rivers. These weren't little creeks. And right. that's what our rivers would have been like. They would have been these log jams every quarter of a mile. And there would have been these, you know, side channels everywhere wandering out, you know, uh, very complex habitat and, and just beautiful conditions for salmon and, yeah. and steelhead. And yeah. we've lost all of that. Um, except in a few rare places, but essentially it's gone and, yeah. and it's tragic, but it's, it's an eye opener to see it real time and see the fish utilizing it. it it's impressive, you know. Um, it, it's it, the other thing that I find amazing about Alaska is, is that um, rainbow trout um, are very migratory, even if they're not steelhead. Yeah. Um, our own river here in Washington, Yakima, I've spoken to fish biologists there and, and they tell me, because I've been frustrated over the years by um, um, this particular thing that would happen, I'd catch three or four, or maybe even five or six really nice rainbows in a single pool, come back the next day, same fly, same conditions, there's not a fish anywhere to be found. They're moving all the time, they're chasing up and down the river. Um, in Alaska, they do that, uh, the big rainbows do that a lot. Uh, what's fun is that my son and a handful of other fly fishermen in Alaska are bound and determined to figure out how to take um, Alaskan rainbows on a dry fly without fishing a mouse pattern. Now, if, if, if there's mice around, right, that's right. a killer. <laughs> you know, you, won't, you, you don't have any trouble. <laughs> In fact, you kind of have to make sure you don't drag it too close to the water when you're walking, <laughs> or they'll jump out. Um, yeah. um, but I, I, really get a kick, I really get a kick out of the idea that they're trying to figure out how to be effective. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the rainbows up there have to be real predaceous fish on other fish and mice and things like that because there's not a lot of insect life in in at least southeast Alaska. I right. haven't studied streams elsewhere uh, up there, but in southeast Alaska, the water quality is so pure, so low in nutrients that you don't get a lot of insect production. And so Except some rivers have uh, large numbers of grayling. And there's plenty of insects to feed them, but you're right that the majority of them, not only do they not have insects, they don't have grayling either. Yeah, and, and the nutrients in those streams come from the dead salmon. I mean, that, exactly. is, that is the dominant nutrient source. Yep. And yep. so that supports really the ecology of those streams is the dead salmon. And, uh, uh, have you fished Idaho much? Yeah, quite a bit, yeah. Um, you know, the usual places, um, Silver Creek and 
and the Wood River, the Big Wood, and the Lock Saw is one of my favorites. And you know, there's there's a bunch of streams up there that uh, uh, well worth going to fish. And it's, sometimes it's hard to get to Montana because I have to drive through Idaho to get to Montana. <laughs> So there's there's I always rarely make it to Idaho uh, to Montana. I almost always end up in Idaho. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's it's a real <laughs> real conflict to keep driving <laughs> to get to Montana. But I do enjoy Montana. I've spent a lot of time fishing though in British Columbia in Alberta. I have some huh. very good friends uh, that lit, the Canadian friends living up there, and so uh, I often go up there um, because it's great fishing. But I'll see my my friends up there. Uh, so I've spent quite a bit of time over the years fishing both Alberta and British Columbia, both lakes and rivers. Uh, the lake fishing in British Columbia, of course, is famous, the Kamloops area. And I've had some just awesome, awesome lake fishing up there. It's just been a blast. And, and then, yeah, the stream fishing is also quite good. Um, yeah, they have what's interesting, and especially in southern BC, you get over like uh, the Elk River system. It's okay. over by Fernie. It's quite well known. Um, they have a, a green drake hatch there, and it's the same green drake. Sim there's like three subspecies of green drake, so I won't get into that, but there's a subspecies of green drake up there. And it hatches from, say, mid-July until the end of September or mid-September. All summer long, you get this green drake hatch. And it's, it's quite common in, in the southern BC area for the, those green drakes to hatch like that. Um, and one of the cool things was, um, you know, if you've ever fished the upper Columbia River, right where it crosses from Canada to Washington. It, I've, I've been alongside of it and I've fished, is it Kettle? Um, but I've never had a chance to actually fish uh, the big river. Yeah, it's, it's a unique, unique fishery and one worth doing. Uh, you need a boat. It's a giant river up there. I mean, it's like crime yeah. a quarter of a mile or more wide. <laughs> you look across, you go, how can this river be, you know, 500 miles from the ocean? Um, but um, they have a green drake hatch up there. Um, actually, a, a good friend um, uh, that was a, is a guide up there called Dave and I and said, look, we've got this mayfly hatch. We don't know what it is. We want to know what it is. Come up and collect it and tell me what it is. We'll take you fishing. And we did. And it's a, it's a big green drake. Uh, it's, it's Drunella grandis, but it's a subspecies that's uh, hmm. not as common elsewhere. And it's not green. It's more of an amber color. Um, and it's big. It's like a healthy size 10 if not an eight, and uh, it hatches right at dark, which uh -huh. they don't even start fishing for it until seven in the evening, wow. and they fish till dark. And, wow. and it comes up out of 20 feet of water. This green drake's hatching in 20 feet of water on the surface, and you're going, what's the substrate like down there where it's living? You know, I, there's no way to sample the bottom to look for the nymphs. <laughs> Um, without scuba gear and I wouldn't go down and the currents in that river up there no. are, are <laughs> scary they're absolutely yeah. scary you know you get these eddies that look like they'll swallow a boat you know uh, <laughs> but um, it's fascinating fascinating situation with that mayfly really huh. really cool huh. you know. well what's what's the most um, uh, unique situation you discovered in in various hatches were they, was there anything that really, because that, that's a pretty unique one, but. Yeah, there's another one down in Southern Oregon in the Wood River. It, uh, it's down near the town of Chiloquin. It runs into Upper Klamath Lake. Okay. And the Wood River is really unique. It's near Mount Mazama. It's on the east side of where Mount, of, of Crater Lake, which of course was Lake, it was sure. Mount Mazama and it blew up, you know, massive. It's a substrate in the Wood River is all this fine pumice from okay. the explosion and uh -huh. it's very unstable it's moving all the time oh. which is lousy habitat for aquatic insects but there's a mayfly there that's adapted to this unique environment and it's one of my favorite mayflies it's called Amitropus amophilus <laughs> and and uh 
a great name, right? You know, it just rolls <laughs> off the tongue. You know, there's an amicus. <laughs> I'll remember that one. Not. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, it's this mayfly that's adapted to living in this pumice sandy substrate. And it's a good okay. size. It gets three quarters of an inch long. And Dave Hughes and I were down there just like in 19, well, it was before I graduated from grad school. It was probably 1978. We were down there and this mayfly was hatching and we were working on Western mayfly hatches then getting photos. And we took photos of it and I brought samples back to Oregon State and it had never been seen in Oregon before. Oh and my it's God. the only stream that occurs in Oregon. And it's one of the only streams that occurs in the West. Um, huh. And uh, that causes me to ask, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but that causes me to ask a, a question that I've always been curious about. It seems like um, the naming convention for aquatic insects uh, uh, changes on a regular basis. Is that identification of subspecies or is it uh, just, you know, further information about what's out there? What, what is that all about? It, it's about more information about what's out there. Um, okay. As more species, a new species gets uh, identified, and then it's they decide, well, where does this species fit into the classification system? And they go, well, wait a minute. If this is like this, then that's like that, but that doesn't fit here. And it just starts this snowball effect of reorganizing uh, a group of insects. Like, Blue-winged olives are the one of the better examples. It's been reorganized over my career probably a dozen times, and it's still going on. Like I, um, I know, I, <laughs> it confuses me. <laughs> the family Betidae, which is the family right. that blue-winged olives is in, has numerous genera, and we usually think of Betis or Betis being the dominant genus in that. When we fishermen are talking about blue-winged olives, they're almost always referring to to a Betis which is fine, you know, that's gonna be the dominant one. But um, the literature, if you go back to, I'm trying to think of uh, Kusi and Nastasi's book, uh, Selective Trout. And they write about Pseudochloion, uh, which is a genus of Betidae. That doesn't exist anymore. That genus has been reclassified as Acentrella. And so in, huh. in looking at the name, you know, the classification of, of the group and they find um, also it has what has priority with who named it first and, you know, deciding if that name came first instead of this name going back in researching the, the history of the classification. Uh, whatever was named first has priority over any uh, more recent names. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of updating and a lot of changes. And now DNA analysis is throwing another twist in it because as okay, they sure. do more DNA analysis, they find that they have relationships based on morphology don't always line up with the DNA. So they have to reclaim. Well, and I have noticed that it, that it seems like um, there's, uh, there's discoveries in the lab that um, lead to realizing the, that a fly has been classed uh, incorrectly. Um, um, is that is that is some of that evolutionary? Are those bugs changing constantly, or are they are they just so prolific and so varied? Yeah, it's just the diversity is is so large that it it takes. A team of you know specialists to sort it all out, and they're yeah. always they're always discovering something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's one of the beauties of entomology. I when I was in uh, undergrad school at, at Bellingham, I was kind of going towards a fisheries degree and working in fisheries biology. I worked a couple of summers for the fisheries department as I was in school in Bellingham. And it was, it was fun, it was a great job to have as a summer job. But I realized, or at least for me personally, it was like, you know, I don't think I wanna do 30 years of work as a fish biologist because out West, you have basically five or six species of fish that you're gonna be managing, right? I mean, the Selmonids. 
and yeah, there's you know some warm water fisheries out there, but it's a very small group of organisms that you're dealing with. And I thought I'm going to get bored with that, mm. but aquatic insects you will never get bored with. <laughs> there, there's, I mean, at every turn there's something that you don't know about or a new discovery. The and, number of fly boxes that I own is a testament to that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm never going to get bored studying insects, and that's what I'm going to do. And, <laughs> and that's proven to be true. Um, I, I remember clearly, and this was probably 20 years ago, when I realized I had to have more than one fly fishing vest because I didn't want to sit down and go through all of the boxes for every trip that I took, right? I could kind of uh, break them out that way. But um, it, it is amazing, uh, and we and we haven't even talked about caddis flies today. I mean, that, you know, because they're fascinating to me too, and I think uh, probably in some respects uh, misunderstood more than mayflies because their behaviors aren't as um, predictable, shall we say? I mean, in, within species, they are. Yeah. But um, you know, you you see uh, you see some mayflies climbing out of the water before they hatch. Some of them shoot to the surface. Some of them shed their um, uh, shed their casings before they even go up. Some of them actually go through metamorphosis and hit the surface um, as full grown uh, adults. Right? I mean, talking about caddis. Caddis. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's there's great uh, and the larval behavior is so interesting. The case building behavior in itself is you know pretty pretty wild, um, yeah. and so that's a great thing uh, to study. My major professor at Oregon State was a caddis specialist, and he he studied a lot of different caddis fly behavior and stuff, and that was kind of his thing. Um, so. Here's something though that a lot of people don't know about, and and your son being a musician, and uh, I I also am a musician. I played drums, and this fits right into that. Um, almost all stonefly adults, the males and females, drum to each other to attract them to to attract mates. Really? Yep. Wow. I've got a whole uh, CD of stonefly drumming. And it's this guy, um, gosh, I can't think, his name's not gonna come to me now, professor down at Texas, I think it was Texas A&M, studied this for most of his, his research. And he would put these stonefly adults on a resonant material so they, you could actually hear it. And he'd record them. And it's fascinating. The males will drum, they, they all have a hard plate. If you look at the underside of the abdomen on a stonefly adult, there's a real hard plate on the tip of the abdomen. And they, they tap that on, on the stems of the wood that they're on. And it wow. sends vibrations through the wood that the other one picks up with their antenna. So if you're sitting under a tree full of stoneflies, you're not gonna hear it. But if you put them on a resonant material, you can actually get the sound and record it. And he's wow. got all these recordings of the sound and the, the females reply with a different drum rhythm and different species are different. Amazing. That's <laughs> it's, amazing. It's, I don't know how I would incorporate that in a good imitation, but. <laughs> well, it's a great pickup line at a bar. You know, you can say, hey, you want to come <laughs> to my place and listen to the stonefly drumming, you know? Um, but uh, it's never worked for me, but anyway. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating, you know, so that's what you just got to love these insects, man. I mean, at, at every turn, they're doing some things that you just kind of shake your head and go, and that's, that's just amazing. Probably uh, the most fun I've ever had on a hatch of insects, actually, it's a fall, it's not a hatch, um, is um, uh, the October caddis. Yeah. When they come back to the river, and they bounce around on top of the stream and the trout go nuts. I've had trout jump, leap out of the water and grab my artificial as I'm finishing my forward cast. It's like, it's, it's remarkable, it's remarkable. Well, then you have to answer this question. Well, if you could, 
I'd, I'd like to hear an answer. I don't have an answer, but on the Deschutes, has a decent fall uh, October caddis hatch, but the fish have no interest in the adults at all. None. Yeah. I've never caught a, on a dry fly in the October caddis on the Deschutes. The guides, yeah. the guides don't ever fish the dry fly because you're not uh, going to catch anything with them. You can uh, catch them on the pupa pattern, sure. uh, but they won't take but, it. But uh, when do they see the pupa pattern? That must Early. be extinction for that river because mostly they crawl themselves out onto a rock before they husk. That, they do. Uh, they they that crawl out on rocks. Yep. To emerge, they crawl out on rocks. But those pupa are moving along the stream bottom like a migrating like a stonefly to get over to the shore because they're oh, they're okay. they're pupating out uh, in the channel and then they have to migrate over to rocks that are you know sticking above the water to crawl okay. out. And okay. so the pupa are getting washed into the current during that migration. And I know that there's a there's some streams that I love to fish in Idaho, where the October caddis and I, I and I'm always trying to target it because I think it's just the most incredible hatch there is, um, in terms of just just sheer oh, it's almost comedy you know fish are jumping, <laughs> caddis flies are bouncing around it's quite the experience. But um, um, there are some streams that they won't pay any attention to the caddis until well into the egg laying and fall portion. They won't pay, I, I, they can be on the water, they can see them, um, you know, they, they can be behaving uh, um, in a way that a trout, you'd expect a trout, and in other streams, they trout do chase them. But um, there's a couple of streams that just, there's an October caddis crawling all over you and doesn't matter. They're not going to take them. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are several species of October caddis, and I've often wondered if there's some that don't taste good. <laughs> Going back to that. <laughs> I don't know. That's I, interesting. <laughs> I, I haven't, I haven't uh, explored that as we talked about, so I don't know the answer, but um yeah it's curious uh, but i've had very good fishing on other streams with the october caddis so it's, it is a lot of fun yeah so, so, so rick we've spent an hour and a half talking and i could probably go on for another couple but um uh, i want to take the time to uh thank you very much for doing this um looking forward to uh getting it on line so that people can uh hear from you um and obviously we'll stay in touch and and i hope we have a chance at some point to meet on the river that would be great yeah well thanks for contacting me and setting this up david it was it was a pleasure i'm glad you enjoyed it yeah take care take care